everyone, and welcome to Collider Nightmares. It's your pre-Comic-Con show, you guys. We're going to get all the good dirt out. Maybe a little speculation about what we'll see there, but we'll bring you all of the latest scary movie news coming from San Diego Comic-Con. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're here. We're in studio. We're ready to rock and roll. We have an amazing panel, including to my left. She was absent last week, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, no, Miss Perry Nemeroff. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I was absent just because I haven't been here for like days Star Wars now. Celebration. Yeah. yeah. She's I'm not representing my hard t shirts today, but I love this shirt, so that's I okay. Have to do it. That's fair. You you that that's you get the pass this Thank week. Thank you. And to her left we have Mr. Mark Ellis. Uh, do I get any points for my Super Mario shirt? You it get points for your haircut. I feel good about it, and I did feel good about it until movie talk, and then it all went to crap. But I like it. Thank you to the barber in Fort Lauderdale who helped me with the quaff. I feel good going into Comic Con. Whoa, that's a Florida haircut? It's a, apparently it's it's it's, it's mulletless. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I got this in Florida, so it's a Florida haircut. Amazing. Sunshine. Good for you. And to my right is Mr. Mark Riley. Hi, everyone. I like Mark Ellis's hair. Spez from the greatest hair. <laughs> right? Of, of right. Come on. Collider, Come so. on. It's a good, fine haircut. Thank Thanks you. for having me, Collider Nightmares. I'm y happy to be here. You are welcome. So before we get started with our lovely sidebar right over here, uh, of course, just as we were about to come on, a brand new trailer and poster for Ash vs. Evil Dead uh, hit the web. Now, we're bringing, we talked about the teaser, I believe, last week, but we had to talk about this trailer, at least at the top of the show, because we've got a full two and a half minutes of red band bloody gore fest, and I love it. Also, it answers our question we posed last week about what happened in Jacksonville, where Mark got his haircut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it was a little north of Fort Lauderdale, but same state. Basically, Mark was uh, partying with Ash and the gang, and the apocalypse started, and he got a haircut and then got the hell out of there. So let's talk about this. I love this trailer. It was allegedly banned from Comic-Con, which Perry calls shenanigans on. But you guys, what are your reactions to this? This is an amazing, I love this trailer, but I leave it to you to tell me if I'm wrong. Oh, I am so freaking excited. You guys know I am absolutely obsessed with Ash vs. Evil Dead. If you are not watching it, stop everything and watch it now. 30-minute episodes, and you can burn through them really quick, and it's tons of fun. This trailer is just spot on. It's so exciting, and it, it finally gives you some of the story details, because as we know from the last one, Ruby's back in the game. I was wondering how she factored in. It's nice to know that she factors in this way because I was really excited about how that relationship was progressing last season. And then given what happens in the end, it kind of, you know, changes away from what I was expecting I was going to get, but in, in a good way. But holy crap, the, the blood and the gore and the the makeup effects in this, so spot on. Those demons, blood, limbs, uh, the the part where the car, the, the wheel yes. tears the yeah. person's face off. I love it. So gross. I love it. Well, so I want to put it to the panel, you know, for people who aren't necessarily caught up on the show, I feel like this, this trailer is a really good say, way to say, hey, you know Ash. This, you don't have to put two and two together. This is the Evil Dead you know and love. We're kind of restarting the... I don't know if they're restarting it necessarily, but I think you could bring people in who hadn't caught up on the show and they could still enjoy it. What, yeah. Gentlemen, what were your reactions? I mean, look, it, this trailer did what any good movie sequel trailer should do, where not only does it make me want to watch this, but it makes me want to investigate what has already happened on the show because as Bruce Campbell's character Ash is described in this trailer, it was horrible and awesome. And that's what I love. It looks scary as hell, but it also looks like a lot of fun. The practical effects looked so good, so well done, so realistic looking, but you know they're having fun with it. It's that right level of violence that looks realistic, but it also has a very cartoonish element to it. So you're having fun with it, and you're not taking it too seriously. That's what I wanted to see from Ash vs. Evil Dead. Absolutely. And Mark Riley, where are you? Are you caught up yet? Are you going to be caught up? I am going... This trailer, I'll say this, you kind of made that point. I'm in. I need to now see this. So what I'm going to do is, after Stranger things because I'm almost done. Which should be a priority. Mm. Yes. Which Anybody is a priority. Yeah, you guys, seriously. It just All you have to do is go on Twitter and you'll see. <laughs> after that and after Comic-Con, I'm going to go home. I'm going to make sure I get this because this trailer, it just reminds me so much of my love for the movies. This is all things great. Ash versus Evil Dead. I only got to see the press screening of it. So I, only episode one of the first season. I'm in. I mean, look at this thing. 
How can you not be? And why do they ban it at Comic Con? Bunch of wusses. Come on, this is not. <laughs> yeah, I don't, well, I don't know if it was really banned. Well, I think they're just saying that, that, right? Are they? Yeah. Is it a press release thing? I think it might be. Did you guys see the the Evil Dead nod in this though? Tell us. I liked that. Well, they they had the uh, when you go back to Ash's house, they had the mm -hmm. the name. Oh yeah, oh, the name. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nice to see. I'm curious to see if that's all it's gonna be, and that's how they'll do their little nod back or if there's something more to that I don't know yeah there's a lot more to this story I can't wait to see how it unfolds so all right October guys get your star subscription ready catch up it's then we'll bring you more Yash versus Evil Dead as as it comes because there will be a lot more nice. a lot lot more so let's dive into our first topic in fresh meat now I love this story um just because it's pure speculation and it's fun but I kind of also hope that we're being crystal ball uh, fortune tellers and it comes true so, oh and my notes just disappeared <laughs> that's okay we'll riff <laughs> for you Clark don't worry. So, it's, it's conjuring three and it involves an animal you know what I think we had, I think we have I don't know how to use my Mac. How do I, I got it? I got it. How do I switch? The... Is this the plot of the Conjuring <laughs> here, here, here. 3? Hold on, here we go. Do the Warrens work at the <laughs> Apple store and they have to help Clark get her notes here. back? Terrifying we went stuff. That way. Oh, wait. Yeah, you have uh, you have a thing Don't here. Don't worry. The I'm best sorry, hair in the business is on the case. Air, okay, we can pull Isn't it. That? No, no I can it. pull it up. It's okay. All right. I got it. I got well, it. Right we here. tried. Sorry, guys. That's going to go in the blooper thing. I think that was Bathsheba saying, screw you. Don't you talk about Don't say her name. There's a creepy nun standing right behind you. <laughs> of course, right there is. behind you. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, the weirdest story cobbled together from bits of news on the internet this week could be one of the most fun, and it involved uh, the potential case for The Conjuring 3. Now, when James Wan was making the rounds to promote the sequel uh, to, the, to the first Conjuring movie, he revealed to IGN that he thinks that the next movie should take place in the 80s, considering the first two were set in the 70s. Next, he revealed to Cinema Blend that that the potential for things to get a bit hairy for the Warrens was quite large, saying maybe we could go and do it like a classic American werewolf in London style. That would be awesome. The Warrens set against a backdrop of the Hound of Baskerville. Now, it is worth mentioning that the Warrens did write a book entitled Werewolf, a true story about demonic possession where they claim a man, William Ramsey, whose bizarre seizures terrified the English town of the South End on C uh, may have been possessed by the spirit of a werewolf. Mm. And I kind of love this. Um, now, Perry, you are familiar with the Warrens both on and off screen. I know you've read some of their books. Are you excited for a story like this? Sadly, I haven't read this book, but now it's going on the list. I'm really <laughs> excited for this. First, because I like the idea that he wants to do something in the 80s because as we know from the first two movies, James was really good at doing period pieces. And this to me is the perfect direction to take this franchise because it's still a Warren's case file, but at the same time, it's something different. We've seen two possession movies. There are some similar elements in the two of them, but this sounds really fresh to me. And just in terms of the werewolf idea, idea in particular, I like the sound of something like that being connected to a demonic possession mm -hmm. and not necessarily, oh, you're like, you know, a, like a Twilight kind of version where right. someone just is a werewolf for whatever reason they have become a werewolf, whether it's lineage or or a bite or something like that. I like the idea of a demon and and trying to figure out how, how human... Uh, like very, very realistic human issues like a seizure could then, they could use those biological or whatever the proper term is, ways of kind of figuring out whether or not that person is possessed. Because mm -hmm. then it brings us back to The Conjuring 2 and that person who was trying to debunk the situation. So a lot of potential there. Oh, you're going to need somebody debunking stuff in Conjuring 3. <laughs> if you have a demonic werewolf possessing somebody, <laughs> that is going to need someone like Franca Patante, I think, played that character. Like, hey, guys, what are we all really talking about here? <laughs> There's got to be a logical explanation for it, but I would love to see it. I really would. It is a risk because The Conjuring deals strictly with you know the the ghost element turning into demonic possession mm -hmm. towards the end of the movie this is a whole other ball of wax it really depends on how far they want to take the werewolf aspect mm -hmm. of the demonic possession was this guy just acting like an animal or are you going to go full wolf with this marketing campaign where every trailer ends with like a werewolf running through the street howling at the full moon like did the guy go crazy when there was a full moon mm -hmm. was he killed with a silver bullet like how werewolfy is it going to be and how much do they want it to be for the movie because The Conjuring has always struck me and The Conjuring 2 a little less so but still as a very serious horror mm -hmm. movie so you risk introducing a werewolf element 
and it dampening the effect of, oh, this really happened, versus these are just people who loved investigating creepy stuff, and sometimes it ended up feeling real, and other times it was just some nutcase running around in the woods naked. Yeah, I like the idea of, you know, look, it's no secret that the Conjuring franchise has basically perfected a formula. I mean, we, we can all recognize that in the similarities between the first film and the second film, and I kind of, I don't know, for me as a fan of the franchise, I really do want to see them shake it up a little bit. Uh, Mark Riley, what are your thoughts here? It's interesting. I'll tell you. I don't <laughs> know if this will work. Um, I like it set in the 80s. Uh, and it's possibly because I've already I read the, the Demonologist book, which is all their case files. And I think I came upon the best part three. Mm. And it doesn't have to do with the werewolf. But I do like the idea for part four. You know, because right then, then we're, we're, we're gone through all the, the really good case files. However, that being said, there is a lot to be said about a, demo, a demonic possession that also has bits of, um, what is it called, the lycanthropy? Yeah, yeah. Who it's, it's a delusion that they believe that they're a werewolf. Now, you couple that with the de demonic possession, something actually going on, and then the Warrens get involved, it could be interesting. And you will need the debunker who says, oh, come on, you're not a werewolf. Let's. But then what happens when this guy actually thinks they are? There is skin cases of like mm -hmm. hair and stuff that are actually based in science. So you could do this mishmash of everything. And I think if you handle it correctly with the right director, it might be something. Well, it's kind of interesting. And I did a little bit of reading about this, the real life case, and and this man who was a slight man, he wasn't a large guy, was it was somehow coming up with these feats of strength and jumping on people and attacking them essentially. Uh, I think he was arrested and he attacked a police officer like right there, lights on, everything, thinking he was a wolf or behaving like an animal. Wow. And so that kind of stuff, when you get into body contortions, when you get into uh, when you get into that type of, of like you were saying, Riley, like a like a mindset, like the, yeah. like the person yeah. thinks that they're this thing. I also thought about. I know this is like a leap, and you're gonna have to go with me. But a couple of years ago, when that man who was high on bath salts thought he was like behaved essentially like a zombie, as we know zombies, yeah. he was eating somebody's face. Like it was it was incredibly morbid and scary. But the point is, whether or not zombies zombie didn't rise from the dead. But if you saw that thing happen, guess what? That looked like a zombie to me, right? So anyway, just yeah. my two. What, real fast, what do y'all think about werewolves in general? Because I think that they're really hard to do modern day. Mm. Like in 2016, I think it would be very hard to tell a present day werewolf story, but this is set in the 80s, or hypothetically. So maybe it would be more believable? To tell a present day werewolf story, you have to involve what we have present day, and that would be all sorts of social media capturing devices. Everybody can use their phones and film something. So it would have to be something set in like a smaller town where it's not as prevalent, and maybe you catch a clip of it somewhere. But because because that's the thing is like once it's out in the open and everybody has video of it. Same thing if you're going to do a modern day Dracula or Frankenstein tale, which is you have to incorporate all the elements of modern society that doesn't necessarily lend itself to a realistic feel with a werewolf, but I would like to see something new in that vein, and I think that The Conjuring would be the right platform to take a risk. I acknowledge it's a leap, and it is a risk, but I think it's worth taking at this point. Because like Riley said, if it doesn't work out, there's so many different stories you can you can go back to throwing your fastball in Conjuring 4 if this one doesn't pan out. That's mm. probably why so many new horror movies now use the, uh, the found footage aspect of it too, because that immediately mm -hmm. takes care of the whole social media, pictures and video everywhere mm -hmm. issue. But in terms of werewolves in general, I, I think it's totally possible to put werewolves in a modern day setting if they're doing this approach that we've somewhat described here, where it's very realistic human things that are happening mm -hmm. to someone that would make you think, oh, is that a zombie? Oh, is that a werewolf? Mm -hmm. Cause that, that's a really uh, mind F, you know, that idea of being in that kind of situation. And what if you did see something like that? I mean, that could really screw with someone's head. Yeah. Well, I just hope that we can just get back and have a really great werewolf movie. I love the genre of werewolves. The Howling is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I even brought up Silver Bullet last week. I mean, come on. That's a great old Stephen King 80s movie um, based with a lot of nostalgia for me. So I just would love to see a great, great werewolf movie. 
you know, period setting, mm-hmm. today setting, just something that just tells the, the classic mythological story. Somebody's bit by a wolf and turns into a werewolf. What happens? Let's do it. <laughs> I want to see it. That would be fun, too. And for the record, as soon as I finished reading the introduction, my notes appeared back on my screen. Of course it so did. So maybe we had a little bit of a Thanks, little Thanks, Bathsheba. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Bathsheba. Yep. Okay, <laughs> moving on. From the team that brought you The Collector and The Collection comes The Neighbor, starring Starry Eyes, Alex Esso, and Bill Ingvall. Yes, that billing vault of the blue collider, uh, the blue, <laughs> the blue collar <laughs> comedy tour in, um, in the neighbor. So the film takes place in the small town of Cutter, Mississippi, where most people keep to themselves. But when John, played by Josh Stewart, comes home to find his girlfriend Rosie, played by Esso, missing, he suspects that his mysterious and off-putting neighbor, played by Ingval, is somehow involved. John looks uh, or learns that Rosie's life is not all that is at stake after a visit to his neighbor's cellar. It becomes clear that the seemingly quiet town is more dangerous than it looks, and John and Rosie must do more than just run away if they want to survive the night. Uh, All right, so Mark Ellis, we uh, we all watched this new trailer. What are your thoughts here? I love that Bill Ingvall is playing a mixture of Ron White and Larry the Cable Guy. (laughs) You know, like, that's, that's the vibe I got from this neighbor, so he clearly took some inspiration from his fellow comedian buddies. And I thought Ingvall looks great. I, I thought I liked the way this trailer feels. It's got a creepy vibe. And initially, I was rooting for Bill Ingvall to be like, oh, well, we thought it was the neighbor, but he turns out to be like that neighbor in Home Alone who actually is like, oh, no, he just looks scary. He's okay. I think Bill Ingvall's into some really bad stuff in this trailer. And uh, I like it, so I think I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, I'm on board, too. I'm not the biggest fan of his comedy in particular, but I think he looks great in this trailer. Um, Riley, what about you? I loved this trailer. I am so in for this movie. I love Dunstan and uh, he, the collector, so, no, yeah, we, we were yeah. talking about that, right? Okay, mm-hmm. good. Um, yeah, it, this, I was watching it with Wendy. It was like, it came out, I think, last week, at the end of last week, and we're like, oh, what is this? Let's check it out. And it just hooked me immediately because this guy, you go into his basement, he's got some stuff going mm-hmm. on there. I don't even want to get into it, but it, it, it looks like a great movie. And there's just some, and it looks very artistic too. There's mm-hmm. some great shots there. Like that end shot where he's just blowing out the smoke and he's standing in the woods or whatever. I mean, I'm in. I'm in, man. Yeah, and I, I should have, shame on me for not putting this in there, but the um, the co-writers are Marcus Dunstan yeah. and Patrick Melton, um, and they are a team, and there we go. So Perry, now, are you a fan of their previous work, and are you excited for this one? I kind of like the Collector movies. Mm-hmm. I don't love them. They're not something that I feel like watching over and over like some other things but I do really like this trailer at first I thought I was gonna kind of brush it off like oh you know any normal creepy neighbor type story like a disturbia type thing and while the trailer never really goes beyond that I mean it pretty much just lays out the very basics of this plot and that's it that ended up intriguing me for the reasons you guys said because something about the material and the performances kind of just sucks you in and I think it's also something that they choose to do with the visuals and the text towards the end where like not only does that text have that uh that blurry like vignette kind of effect on it but then the images are really dark too so you have no choice but to go like this as you're watching as you're watching and then you're you're sucked in by the end of it I'm also really excited to see Alex Esso in another Mm -hmm. movie because I love her in Starry Eyes and I don't think I've seen her in a feature film I'm not sure if she's made ones between now and then, she, but I haven't seen one. She was in a segment in Tales of Halloween, the I, anthology I did see film, that. but just one, so yeah. yeah. Nah, she needs a feature. She's great. Check out Star- check her out in Starry Eyes if you haven't yet. She's great in it. Great movie overall. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so we're looking forward to it, and we'll keep you posted as a, a release date comes. I don't think we got a release date, but we'll keep you posted, and go watch the teaser. Um, all right, so next up from Fede Alvarez comes Don't Breathe, the latest horror thriller from the director of 2000. 13's Evil Dead. Now the premise is simple. A group of teens breaks into a blind man's home thinking they'll get away with the perfect crime. They're wrong. <laughs> now on the heels of screenings at Austin South by Southwest and other festivals, a 360 degree interactive trailer has come online, only adding to the terror of the first full length trailer. So Mark Riley, first things first, how are you, what are your thoughts? I think we're seeing VR yeah. uh, becoming a big part of genre, whether that's games, movies, TV. Allegedly at San Diego Comic-Con, we're going to see a 
VR experience for American Horror Story, yeah. potentially announcing the new title. We don't know <laughs> for sure. Um, but what are your thoughts on on seeing you know the original trailer and now getting to participate in this interactive trailer? Well, if this is the future of filmmaking, which it is, and this is this is such a great use for a horror trailer it fit perfectly i jumped this morning i actually jumped because he you know i don't know if you guys got to see it mm -hmm. but like and i was going around and i was like following him as he was in the darkness and i stopped when he's like going like kind of walking by i'm like this is great and then all of a sudden he's right here and i turn around <laughs> i'm like oh geez man perfect i loved it i think it's such a great idea to do especially for something like this you're in the dark you're being chased by a psychotic blind guy with a gun. I mean, what else do you want? This is, the, it, it was such a clever way of doing this. So I think it really is the future and I think I would expect it to work a lot and do as a lot for horror trailers mm -hmm. in particular. Sure, Perry, now you've seen this film. Oh, Did I've you, seen film. you've seen this film? I've Did seen this film and I'm going to see it again. So oh, that's, good. Con. that's an endorsement if I've ever heard it's, one. <laughs> it's really, really good. I gave it an A minus at, uh, at uh, South by Southwest earlier this year. It's fantastic. Now, with this type of a trailer, having as someone who has seen the movie, um, do you feel like this is a good way to promote this film in particular? It's interesting. I'm a little mixed on this as a VR experience because I've done so many VR experiences. I'm not sure if any of you did the uh, the Insidious 3 one, but mm -hmm. most movie VR experiences like this involve you sitting in a chair with the headset on watching something and you're like you can look around and all that stuff but you're not really interacting and then i'm kind of spoiled because at celebration they had that vr experience uh trials of tatooine and it is kind of like that in the beginning but then with the uh the htc vive thing and the, the, the piece that you hold it turns into a lightsaber and then you can interact with the stormtroopers who are shooting at you and you block you deflect the blaster bolts with the lightsaber cool. and mark ellis is yeah. Face was just like it's, what? It's this really like tactile thing that like you were doing and you're making something happen. So when I see VR where it's looking around again, I'm like, eh, you know, I, I've seen this before. I will say that I think you could have two experiences with this particular VR experience where if you're looking and you are and you're only looking in one direction or you're looking at the wrong times, it might suck. If you happen to just turn your head when you know, he pulls someone into the darkness. Oh my God, that's a jump scare right at your computer there. Yeah. And it's really effective. So hit or miss for me. All right, Ellis, what are your thoughts? I mean, this premise is why teenagers should not be allowed to vote because they're <laughs> morons. Have you never <laughs> seen a superhero movie before? If they lose one sense, they're going to gain their senses. The exactly. other four ones become heightened. Come on, you're better than this. As far as the VR experience, it wasn't the greatest interactive thing I've ever seen in my life, but for a horror movie, it has so much potential as what this could be that I was like, Riley, like I, 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 I did jump a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> man. I think that's a misconception about people who love watching horror movies movies is that oh you don't get scared by anything i get scared by everything yeah. and that's what i love about it. i love being scared that's and so point. i did enjoy this trailer it oh, I, i'll agree with perry because i've done some vr headset stuff where you are fully immersed in action and it didn't have that vibe to it so don't go in expecting that but it does add to the scares a little bit in my opinion mm -hmm. so it wasn't perfect but i do think that it holds a lot of promise for the future because if there's one genre of filmmaking that deserves cool vr it's going to be hard yeah, I like the headset experience. Um, I did The Conjuring 2, did a great one at the junket where you're just- Werewolves? It wasn't werewolves, oh, not damn yet. It. Oh, that's damn it. so great. And um, and Lights Out has this booth over at the Chinese theater. Did I, you get to do it? I, it was it was in uh, the Burbank, la the Burbank uh, theater last night and I was walking around to look for food and I had just gotten back and off the plane. So, you know, like I was just all gross and, and I wouldn't go in there because I needed to cover myself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's fair. But you know what I will say is um with this one in particular with lights out i kind of did fall victim to the idea of like i'm not looking in the right place am i and so i feel like i'm missing a lot mm -hmm. um i i don't know but maybe that's just a clearly user error um still i do think that there's a lot of um <laughs> that's funny. there's a lot of potential for for this if you go into a vr experience look down because sometimes they'll put your body there and it's just this really weird cartoonish body and it's just like it really nice. screws with your head i've turned into homer <laughs> <laughs> all right so next up director mike flanagan who brought you absentia oculus and hush may be putting the finishing touches on his latest endeavor a new ouija movie due out this october from blumhouse but along the way another project of his appears to have gotten lost in the shuffle before i wake a 
supernatural thriller, which stars Rooms, Jacob Trembe, and J Kate Bosworth, has been done for a while now and was originally scheduled for release almost a year ago. For some reason, the movie was pulled even after trailers were released and a release date was announced. Now it looks like Fanagans, that was for you, John Schnepp, <laughs> are going to get a double dose of the director with the new and seemingly official release date set for September 2016. Now, Perry, you uh, you told us uh, before we started rolling that you were talking to Flanagan about this when he was promoting Oculus. I feel like I might have referenced that, like looked at his upcoming IMDb yeah. list. Maybe he hadn't shot it. I don't remember too clearly, but this has been around for a little while. So I'm excited that we finally get to see something because I haven't seen Hush yet, but I'm a big fan of Oculus. I need to go back and watch Hush, I know. But this, this looks interesting to me. When the trailer started, I wasn't quite feeling it. And just because I kind of couldn't figure out what it was, and it almost seemed a little melodramatic yep. to me. And then all of a sudden, we got the line, this little boy's dreams come true. And right after that is the butterfly man. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that has lots of potential right there. And if you watched any of our Oscar stuff this year, you know, I'm a big fan of Jacob Tremblay. And I'm just counting down the minutes until I can see him in something else beyond room. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's great. I think if anything, you know, with a movie like this, where it is slightly, could lean slightly towards melodrama, especially when you're having a parent-child problem or whatever it is, especially a new kid coming into the mix, you really need that kid to sell it. Mm -hmm. You need that kid to be strong in order for this to not completely fall out. And and he is so incredibly talented, so I'm with you. Uh, Riley, how about you? I, were you, because I, I got a little bit of like, you know, this like family, like, okay, we've seen this maybe a million times, then a new kid comes in. and But I don't know, I think there's something special to this. I, you know, this actually is my favorite trailer of the show wow. for all the ones we've lost. This came out of nowhere for me. I, I mean, I think I heard about it through some of the news. I'm obviously familiar with his work, um, with, if, with planning his work, but this just got me. There, Those butterflies coming together and then the eyes lighting up hooked, and I thought it was a great build. I thought it was an interesting kind of setup, and I'm like, okay, they're kind of adopting this kid or whatever, and then he has these butterflies, and the and the family, Kate Bosworth, and, and I'm blanking on his name. Thomas Jane, I think. Thank right? you. Yeah. Um, and they see the butterflies. That that to me is interesting. It's like, wait a minute, they're seeing this now. Something's going on. Oh, but it's pretty butterflies. Everything's nice. Perfect horror setup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Butterflies. Yeah. Follow that butterfly into that dark room, you idiot. So this is great. I I think it's a very very clever idea concept. So. Man, yeah, this hook, line, and sinker with this trailer for me. Ellis, uh, are you a fan of, of Mike Flanagan's work? And if either way, are you excited for this I one? I am, and I was looking forward to this. It, it, it's not necessarily the hook that gets me the most, but I appreciate the trailer for what it was, and I love that Danny Elfman did some of the score for this, mm. for this movie, too. It just makes me very nervous when something's been sitting on the shelf for so long yeah. as a finished product, and September is not always the best dumping ground as far as a movie coming out like you you can start to get some shades of Oscar movies coming out around September but sometimes it also is just where a studio is going to release something because they have no other option and with a movie like this when they've just been waiting to release it for so long it might just be the best available slot they have so it makes me nervous I always go in optimistic especially when it's a horror property but I, I'm gonna be a little trepidatious walking into this thing just because I don't know I, I don't know why it wouldn't have already seen the light of day. Yeah, that's fair. Cautiously optimistic, I think, is a good mm -hmm. way to go into it. But Mike Flanagan does have a good track record of like, being a guy who takes a somewhat conventional premise and then completely turns it on its head. And maybe we'll see him do it again with Oculus. It, and, and I, I liked or I liked Oculus. Oculus. Ouija is what yeah. I meant to say. Yeah, I, I <laughs> just I, I I didn't love Oculus, but I liked I mm -hmm. appreciated the filmmaking aspect of it. So I'm definitely gonna give this a shot. I'm just gonna be a little. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Next up, it's time to switch into our new se our next segment. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Whoa. What was that? Dang. I, I just suck at doing it, so <laughs> I used a voice modulator and I did it that way. It's really good. Why not? I love how yeah, Ghostface is getting in on what's in the box <laughs> over here. Uh, all right. So first up, The Mist, based on the Stephen King novella of the same name, was ordered straight to series on the Spike TV network. Reports have surfaced this week that the show has begun principal photography in Nova Scotia after announcing their principal cast last week. American Horror Story alum Francis Conroy leads the cast alongside Boardwalk Empire and Person of Interest star Morgan Spector and 
and others. The mist tells the story of a foreboding mist that arrives in one small town, ushering in a terrifying new reality for its residents, putting their humanity to the test. What will the people do to survive when they are blinded by fear? Mm. <laughs> Terrifying. The eternal question. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, I wonder it all the time. Okay, so Mark Ellis, first things first. Um, you know, we've seen this trend of adapting movies to TV um, and obviously books to TV and reimaginings. So are you a fan of the Tom Jane movie, The Mist? I'm a fan of the first half of it. Whoa! Because no. you know really? most people say the opposite. Yeah. Let's put our spoiler alert thing up, Cody, because The Mist is very famous for its ending. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I, wait, 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 which I, I didn't hate. I just, I love the buildup. And I think with a very simple premise like this, like there is a weird fog happening. What's going on? What's inside this thing? We're very scared. I thought the buildup was better, what was more well executed than the payoff was for me mm -hmm. anyway. But I like the premise of it coming back into our consciousness somehow. And maybe a TV show is the right outlet. I love that Spike TV is doing it. I think it's nice to see them because Spike TV, who I'm a fan of, used to just be like, hey, we're dudes chugging beer on zebras. And now they're like expanding it <laughs> to, now they're not just showing the Star Wars movies on the weekends. Now we actually get some original content. And I think that's cool. I think it's the right way to go. So seeing the mist broken up into little chunks mm -hmm. that might be bingeable at some point, but week after week, what's going to happen? I think it's the right way to go with that story okay so uh we've got our spoiler alert up i'm going to go ahead and say it because <laughs> this is important uh the novella versus the film yeah so the infamous ending of frank darabont's the mist was not the ending of the novella now in the in the film the mist tom jane uh has you know taken his small son and uh, some other people behind them or with them they're all packed into a car the mist is everywhere they've got a gun and it is not looking good so everyone in the car decides it's time to just kill themselves throw in the towel the people behind them do it he's got enough bullets for either him or his son oh God. to die oh. Tom Jane <laughs> shoots his son oh and kills him only to have the military burst through the mist and try and rescue him. Mm -hmm. It is the most, I've actually have chills just like saying it, and it is a hot studio. But the reason I, I go through beat by beat that ending is because that blew people's minds when they saw it. It is an incredibly dark ending, and Stephen King himself kind of has gone on record being like, yeah, that ending's kind of better than mine. Mm. So <laughs> the question remains, is this going to be a true adaptation of the novella, or are they going to take bits from the movie, which was popular. Perry, what do you think? I'm curious to see what they do with this. And initially, I didn't think that this is the concept that would be good for a TV series, which must, must last however many episodes and then however many seasons. You know, the one thing that's giving me hope, 12 Monkeys. I look at that and, you know, oh, a couple years back, I never would have thought you would have been able to adapt that to series. And they're doing a pretty damn good job with it. So. I, I think maybe they can pull it off and you know this cast looks cool mm -hmm. I I'm not particularly familiar with anybody that they just announced which I kind of find very refreshing I'm a big fan of uh, Frances Conroy yeah. so I'm hyped about her but I do like the fact that I'm just focused on this source material that I love so much and seeing how that turns out rather than focusing on famous faces that I admire too but I'm hopeful I'm gonna watch it definitely all right Riley what about you what do you think they're gonna go dark you think this could be a mini series or, or they'll maybe keep going I think I actually think there are elements in the novella and the book or sorry and the movie that which I love both by the way but I read the novella a long time ago and I forget how it ends I thought that was the ending mm -hmm. I guess I forgot that um, <laughs> I think that you actually could sustain a pretty long series with some of the elements that are brought up especially with like the kind of the the government experiments sure. that are mm -hmm. going on so that I could actually see it being a pretty damn good series and I'm in I do like this book I do, I do like this movie I would hope that there's maybe a little bit of combining of both because there are a lot of fans of the Mist movie did anybody see the black and white version yes I'm so glad you brought that up it's I'm amazing so glad you brought that it up. brings it back to this like old 50s you know movie that it's it it really works a lot better it's very interesting I would highly recommend it so with that being said yeah I think that you could sustain a, a very long series depending on how it's done I'm not familiar with everybody in the cast but um, 
you know, I, I, I like the source material, so I'm going to give it a, a chance. Well, and to your point about the, about maybe an old school throwback or watching it in black and white, this story always reminded me of that Twilight Zone episode, Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Now, granted, at the, you know, I guess spoiler for the 70 year old Monsters Are Due on Maple Street for <laughs> How however dare you? long. But, um, you know, we find out that actually there isn't anything. They, they're aliens that have just, they're screwing with these people, but they've watched how these residents of this town react and turn on each other. And I like those elements. It's more about the people that are the monsters, not the monsters like being the monsters. Like an experiment, yeah. That's yeah. right. We're rats in a maze. That's right. That's right. And so with the mist, we do know that there are monsters. I mean, that's a given. But I think that it could be really fun to watch it play out over 10 episodes and see the you know, morality tale at play here to see the interaction of the small town mm -hmm. um, under real heightened circumstances. It's also nice because you can end it like that. Like, yes, you <laughs> like can. If the show's not pulling ratings <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay, we got one more episode, it's like, all right, just end it. Like, yep. like, just let us see what happens. Just Tom Jane, the kid in the face, and yeah. then you're done. We can done. be in the mist oh, for there you go. seasons if we want. We, we, can be, we can literally be in a fog for 15 years, or we can be in a fog for two days. Every time I see, every time it's super foggy here in LA, I always, I I always say if you see Tom Jane run, he's gonna oh, Tom Jane you in the, the face. The guy nice. played the Punisher not too long before the mist came that's out. Like, what did you expect him to do? You know? Yeah, exactly. What could he do? Okay, that's that was just for me. Anyway, moving on. Um, oh, Jason Voorhees, you poor lost boy, you. <laughs> After years of struggle ah. to bring the hockey mask wearing villain back to the big screen, the CW had been actively pursuing a weekly series based on the iconic teenage horror title. Way back in August of last year, Stephen Long Mitchell was on record saying he was working to develop a, t a TV series based on the property for the teen network, uh, The CW. Described as a cross between the first season of True Detective and Twin Peaks on acid, which, <laughs> awesome. Sure. Uh, well, sure, CW why not? Appropriate. Sounds very <laughs> CW to me. Um, he went on to elaborate saying, Part of the fun of the show is exploring, is this Jason or is this a copycat? Is it possible that Jason has been around all these years? Is Jason a monster? Is he real? Is he a serial killer? And really exploring who and what Jason is is part of the whole thrill of the show. So for the record, as a not the biggest Friday the 13th fan, I was so in on this premise. But unfortunately, uh, rumors started to surface that the CW had killed the series, which wasn't a stretch, considering the network has passed on all of their horror pilots, including The Dark Side, a Tales from the Dark Side anthology reboot from none other than Joe Hill. So now, the Friday the 13th fan site has a little hope for you guys out there looking to return to Camp Crystal Lake on TV. Uh, the site Friday the 13th franchise.com is reporting that maybe the deal isn't as dead as we thought. Word on the street is that the CW is waiting until spring 2017 to definitively pass on the narrative series, with the option allegedly up for grabs at other networks if they decide to pass. The rumor is that the holdup revolves around no one being able to crack the story of the new Friday the 13th series, which apparently is the problem with the movies, too. I, I don't know why the Jason Voorhees is such a mystery, but at least we all have the video games. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to our resident uh, counselor at Camp Crystal Lake. Yes. Mark Riley. <laughs> Who survived, by the way. You did. So yes. are you holding out hope that maybe we could see Jason on the t on TV? Do you even want to see Jason on TV? What the hell is going on? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I love Friday the 13th. I want the movie. Um, I think that, you guys, you're trying to reinvent the wheel here with Jason. He's a, kill a lumbering dude that walks around in the woods with a machete. Go. Okay? That's all you need. What's interesting about this series is that there that there was the meta um, mm -hmm. spin on it that it's like it's actually the movies are based on Camp Crystal or a, a camp where it happened. So is this guy real? I kind of like that aspect, but if you want that, go watch Scream. That that's the 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 the, the quintessential movie with that. For this, I would love to. I like just the premise of there's an FBI agent that is looking for his missing brother. And maybe there's a serial killer in Camp Crystal Lake. Now, if you go at that angle with like, I, we've never seen the FBI go after Jason. Start maybe there. Maybe he, he's like looking for his brother. He brings in some CSI things and, and he's looking into the legend that might or might not be a serial killer. I don't know. But I think they're, they're chasing their tail with this and I think they need to give up. 
and go look at the movie and start there. Interesting. That's very doom and gloom of mm. you. Yeah. All right. So, Mark Ellis, what are your thoughts? Did you hear what Riley just said? He said <laughs> he's never seen the angle of the Federal Bureau of Investigation <laughs> looking for Jason. Like, that sounds so How? stupid, yeah. but yeah. it ain't the worst idea I've ever heard. Oh, it's absolutely stupid, but can be done. I, the, the true detective thing, I was like... Because here's the issue, you can't please everybody at the same time. There's going to be hardcore fans that want to see Jason go out and be a slasher, and then you have other people who are so sick of that trying to be rebooted that maybe if we did a different spin where it's somebody who's looking into all these mysterious things happening around Camp Crystal Lake. And, I, you know, I'm just a sane guy. I can't believe that it's some kid that drowned years ago and now he's back to wreak havoc. But as you keep peeling the layers back and as you keep having subsequent episodes it points more and more to something of a supernatural occurrence yeah. but once we find out who the killer is then it just that that's when it's you you lose all the story that you had mm -hmm. because now we know okay now we know who's doing it and we just got to go out and stop him so it, it's hard to please everybody at the same time. That's why I don't know that it's going to work as a TV show. Yeah, yeah. and it sounds like in this premise, by the way, maybe wouldn't even focus on Jason all that much, to be honest. It's like the pursuit of Jason. And how much killing is he going to do? I don't know. Perry, you, I know you love you some slasher movies. I do. And you love Scream the TV show. I, so, do you I see love Scream the TV show, but I still won't say it's the Scream TV show that I would have wanted originally, which is my fear for something like this because why do this if it's so disconnected from the source mm -hmm. material? If I get a Friday the 13th sort, uh, TV show, I want it to feel like the movie. It's as, as cool as it sounds to have an FBI agent tracking him down. I don't know if that's the direction I'd want them to go. And based on that description too, it doesn't sound like a CW show. And I have yeah. a feeling if they try to do that, it's going to be really dumb and silly. Mm -hmm. The CW is not that kind of thing. But I, that article that you sent out, I like what they said because apparently if they don't move forward with it in like April they'll make a decision or something mm -hmm. in April 2017 and if they decide not to move forward with it then someone else can pick it up and apparently fans have been calling for Netflix to take it and Ooh. I think if it goes to Netflix that opens up the door to much better possibilities so hopefully it goes that direction because mm -hmm. I don't want I don't really want to see a CW Friday the 13th that's done this way that's yeah fair. now if that special agent for the FBI is Johnny Utah from Point Break <laughs> crossover sensation. I think you're on to something else. Maybe maybe season <laughs> two of Stranger Things will be Friday the 13th and we can give the Duffer brothers. I just made uh, I'm interested. I'm day. listening. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, uh, no, that's a good way. No, you, yeah. Stranger, yeah. Stranger <laughs> Things season two. Crab Crystal Lake. I'm just saying. Think about it. Call me. I got all the ideas. Uh, okay, so now we have a very special announcement from our missing friend, John Schnepp. Where did he go? Well, here you go. We're about to find out. What's up, my spooky friends? I can't be on Collider Nightmares this week because I'm already on my way to San Diego Comic-Con. I'll be there the whole week enjoying stuff. You'll see me on Collider Movie Talk and all the other stuff. But I got a special announcement I want to share with you and all my metalhead friends. I am writing the Slayer comic for Dark Horse. That's right. It's a, a, a limited series, three issues. It's coming out towards the end of this year. But we're going to be at San Diego Comic-Con. Slayer is playing an exclusive uh, show at House of Blues on Thursday night. And then Friday at booth 2615 at Dark Horse at 3 p.m., I'll be there with Slayer. And we're going to be signing some limited edition uh, posters and other things that they're giving away in conjunction with the comic book. So just want to share that release. I'm writing the Slayer comic. It's coming out at the end of the year. I'll see you at San Diego Comic-Con. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you are going to be in San Diego uh, this week for Comic-Con, or if you just happen to be there, go visit our friend Mr. John Schnepp and his awesome new project and his awesome friends, Slayer. And, uh, <laughs> cause that's how they do it. Yeah, he did it better. Mark, or Mark Riley did it better. Okay, so congratulations, Schnepp, at Schnepp and we'll see you in San Diego. So. Now we're going to do uh, a segment called Jump Scares. And to be honest with you, yes, we have done it before because I remember that graphic. So this is more of a debate conversation uh, topic. And I'm really excited that we're getting to talk about this because a lot of you guys on social media had been positing very similar questions. So here's, here's the basic premise. Uh, it's a question that arises often in horror, sci-fi, and fantasy. Why aren't movies scary anymore? Now this weekend, 
and a Collider Nightmares viewer, Frankie Segura, tweeted at us posing the question. He's currently 25 years old, and he had just seen William Friedkin's, mu Friedkin's much lauded classic, The Exorcist, for the first time. Frankie was, as he put it, uh, bored by what was Aww. often called the scariest movie of all times, or all time. And he asked, um, "Do you think there are movies people should see at a young age to really appreciate them, or do you think movies today have sort of ruined, sanitized him, or ruined, ruined uh, classic films for him?" So. I think this is a great question, and I put it all to you. You know, have uh, our movies today, are we all so jaded that we are unscarable by a movie that's 40 years old? Or do you think there are expectations at play here that maybe cannot be fulfilled? Hmm, it's good. I think that there's, there's an interesting, it, it really hit me with him not enjoying The Exorcist. I don't, I don't find that surprising, to be honest with you. And I do believe I might get some hate for this, but I do believe that there is a watered down horror movie out there that get, gives people too much or not enough or just a lazy adaptation. Here, let me throw some loud music. Let me throw some blood and guts. Let me throw some jump scares of a cat or whatever that maybe you kind of you kind of get used to seeing something. Is it subconsciously? Is it just I don't, I don't know what it is. So when you look at The Exorcist and you're like, oh, it's not doing the same things that all these other scary movies I've seen are doing. Then I take the aspect of that he saw it later. And, you know, I saw it at a, at a point in my life where, I don't know, where I was really getting into film, not just horror movies, but film. And this was a movie that I actually watched in a, a cinema class at USC. And so it, we kind of broke it down very analytically on like, in a filmmaking way, not just a scary movie. So I had such an appreciation for this movie. And then because of it, and then re and then I did all this other stuff. I read the book, I read the stories of the making of it. So it really got into my psyche that this is such a brilliant movie and scary. So it's interesting that it wasn't scary for him. I, I, I don't know if I have an exact reason. I think that there is a watered down version of horror movies out there that they just, they rush to the finish line. Mm -hmm. They think that just a lot of blood and a lot of loud sounds and jump scares will suffice without story. I'm so glad that you brought up you know, a story element here. Because uh, for me, you know, The Exorcist, I saw it at the age of 12, scared the crap out of me, of course, because of the sound design and the, and the, and the you know, incredible makeups and the visual effects and all of those things. But as I got older and, and watched it from a cinema perspective, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, this movie is not a horror movie. It's a drama. Yeah. It's a family drama. Whether you're talking about Karis and, or I'm sorry, yeah, you're talking about Karis and his mother. Oh, yeah. Whether you're talking about you know Chris Chris McNeil and her daughter this is this is a story that is diving into fear in a different way mm -hmm. fear of losing your faith fear of losing control of your child fear of not being able to help your parents and then on top of that you have all of the visceral blasphemous stuff so I think that when you have these things that are called the scariest movie of all time how could anybody possibly live up to that especially when you've got 40 years of technology uh, you know that has come after it. Yeah. But so, what are what do you guys think? This movie still scares the crap it's out of me. It still I mean, scares me too. I wouldn't say it keeps me up <laughs> at night. And to be honest, rarely anything does anymore. But this, to me, I can watch it over and over. And something about it just gets under my skin. And I have not. I've seen this movie more times than I can count. And I still, I, I'm completely uncomfortable with the last act of this movie. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm it really same. freaks me out every time. And even though some special effects, visual effects and whatnot are not as good as they are today. There's something about a classic movie. It's like, you know, if I gave you a, bo a book and I'm like, this is the book of the devil and it was brand new, yeah. printed 2016 and then gave you a book and said, oh, this is the book of the devil and it was covered in dust and looked like the uh, Necronomicon and it was printed in like <laughs> the 16 whatevers, that book would scare you a million times more than the fresh looking copy. And and for me, there's something about older movies like The Exorcist that have that same quality to it. Something about, like if, if they had remade this movie right now, or not even remade it, I just mean made Exorcist for the first time nowadays, 
that wouldn't be as scary to me as knowing it was made way back then and it's mm. history and all that. Something about that will make it eternally horrifying to me. Mm. Ellis? I appreciate everything you guys are saying here. Clark, I know that there's elements of drama in The Exorcist. That is a horror movie, man. That movie scares the crap out of me to the point where I do not like watching the last part of it because I will get scared and I will have nightmares. I think it is the scariest movie ever made. I will agree with what you guys are saying on an aesthetic level that it, you know, if the it, the effects or the makeup don't look as good as they would today, but there also is something to counter that that Perry brought up, which is the aged classic quality of it I think enhances the creepiness the mm -hmm. fact that it doesn't it's not shot in the you know this glossy way that it would be made now that you you have all these psychological elements which really are the scariest things about the exorcist is as horrifying as it is to look at what Satan has done from the inside to Reagan and you see you know all that stuff at the end just flashing at you the psychological terror that I still go through when I see that movie is why I'm so reticent to put it on it, mm -hmm. it, it's not just oh I can't see a picture of Reagan. I can Google it right now and it'll freak me out a little bit, but I'll be okay. But the psychological stuff about how the devil gets into this mm -hmm. little girl is is so scary on a such a primal level to me that I think that that can be lost in the way that Riley was talking about how it's a classic film. That a lot of times I will put on a movie that's a classic and be like, I don't get it. And then you watch it again. And that's the great thing about you know having a film class in high school or college is that you watch these things over and over and over again and you break them down and you come to appreciate them. So uh, whoever wrote the question, I think that if you do watch The Exorcist a few times and you break down just why it is so horrifying on a psychological level, it might really get into your skin. But if you can watch The Exorcist and not be scared by it, you are a better human than I. <laughs> well, I think too, you know, I, I like the idea and the reason I brought up what scary, our movie's still scary, because he poses the question, should I have watched this when I was 12? Like mm -hmm. maybe most of us on this panel did and it scarred us for life. See, I, I watched it for the first time when I was in like second grade. It was on and it didn't Whoa. scare me. I actually thought it was funny because there was a girl about my age puking on adults I'm like ah, there yeah. you go stick it to the man Reagan <laughs> and then I saw it again when I was in fifth grade three years later and totally different effect that's the effect that I still have with the exorcist to this day is when I saw it when I was in fifth grade Hmm. And well, and to that point, I think that so that's a really good point. And you know, people ask all the time. I feel like we get this question all the time. Why aren't horror movies scary? I want a movie that's gonna scare me. And I would put it out there. And I don't know how you guys feel about this, but what scares you when you're in the second grade is not the same as what scares you when you're in the fifth grade and when you're 16 and when you're 21 and when you're 30 and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And so the visceral scare of watching, you know, um, Night of the Living Dead and seeing ghouls decomposing and eating your organs, like that when you're a child, sure, could be traumatizing. But when you think also about the psychological terror that goes along with it, things that scare you when you're an older adult aren't shouldn't scare you when when you're a child, and right? it can be the same movie that has a different, different Absolutely. effect. Like way back when, I might watch any old horror movie and be afraid that the villain is going to come after me in the middle of the night. However, nowadays, for example, with The Exorcist, I think more of the family aspect, and I'm paying a lot more attention to how it's pulling the family apart, and that's what freaks me out. Absolutely, and well, and I want to mention one more thing because I don't want to say like uh, Frankie who asked this question. I, I had a similar experience with Rosemary's Baby. You know, I was in film school, and I was like. Oh, okay, I love horror, I gotta watch Rosemary's Baby, it's the scariest movie of all time, or one of the scariest movies, here we go. And I watched it and I was like, this is, I don't, this is boring, I, yeah. I'm bored. Um, and then, but that was as a 19 year old girl. And then as a 23 year old young woman living in Los Angeles, I watched it and I was like, huh, I'm getting this in a different way than I did before and now, Rosemary's Baby scares the crap out of me because the idea of somebody selling you out and all of those things that are also on top of the demonic, <laughs> the devil and the devil worship that's going on next door, those are things that are terrifying. Just getting a girl pregnant scares me, <laughs> much <you> less <laughs> she happens to be carrying the spawn of Satan in there <laughs> on top of it. Fair you know? point. Yeah, that's a bummer, man. Fair <laughs> point. So I would just say, I don't know, final thoughts. I would just say, you guys, you know, um, things, I would say adjust your expectations in a way. The thing that viscerally terrifies you when you're a 
12 year old child probably isn't necessarily going to be the same thing when you're 30 but maybe it will yeah and I would say there's a lot of good points that were made on this panel and you know re-watching a movie and kind of noticing some of the little things especially the exorcist you guys were talking about I remember just hearing oh we have mice and just yeah. the start of that is so like you hear the and you're yeah. like oh that's the start of it that gets on that primal level. So revisiting some of these movies, you said it with Rosemary's Baby, I did it with, the first movie to ever scare the holy hell out of me was Amityville 2, mm -hmm. The Possession, because at the time I saw it, I was totally into my family, and this is the actual story of DeFeo killing his family, so it screwed me up for weeks. So, <laughs> but I revisited the, like maybe two Halloweens ago, and I'm like, meh, you know? So <laughs> different times in your yeah. life are gonna, uh, are gonna affect your horror viewing experience. Definitely. All right, so let's move on to Twitter questions. Uh, first up, Adam Burdett asks, what are some horror movie scores that you think are underrated? For me, it's Candyman by Philip Glass. That is such a great question, and that is a great score. Um, I'll start it out. I love John Murphy's 28 Days Later, um, the material he created for that specifically. I mean, I love the whole, I listen to the whole soundtrack, um, you know, often. I think it's beautiful, but that song, that's iconic that in a heartbeat song that was later used in a Louis Vuitton ad and I was like I don't think you guys know where this came from but uh, but for me the 28 days later score is one of my favorite but how about you guys I feel like this is an underrated because we've been talking about it, but I have to give a shout out to the It Follows score mm -hmm. because that's one that not only works really well in the movie, but I could also listen to it for fun. I love horror scores when they come up with a great theme song that then gets stuck in my head. Another one I am slightly obsessed with is the Insidious score. Oh, yeah. When I was making short films and, and my first feature, I was constantly using that as the temp track to just about everything because I think it's brilliant and plays so well in the movie. The reason certain scares in that movie are so horrifying is because of the way the score booms in and that's a perfect example of something that's not a jump scare but it's it's meant to be there that was so well done but i'm gonna go with as like an underrated one the score for dead silence oh. which is not my favorite movie i don't love that as much even though i'm a big fan of james wan but I, his name is charlie clauser and so bashara didn't do that one no no and i love all of his work too mm -hmm. but this one is a great it's just it touches on so many classic horror scores, but brings in all these new, like uh, like synth orchestral music too. It's it's a great listen, and then he also did uh, he did Saw, and I love that theme song as well. Nice. Ellis, did Van Halen ever do a horror score? Van Halen on, never man. did a, a horror movie. <laughs> uh, they did a Twister, so it's a scary elements in there. But you know, especially by the time if you're a cow, you hear, if you if you're a cow, <laughs> that, that that's your exorcist. It's right there. It's just something tornado ripping through. Um, I, there, there's two very famous composers that aren't really celebrated for their work that they did in scary movies. Howard Shore is one for Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, good which one. Is, yeah. it, it doesn't overpower you, but it's got, it, it's just, it, it creeps up on you. Yeah. And then Ennio Morricone did the thing. And mm. it's, it's just so perfectly balanced with what's going on on screen. That's always been the genius of him, whether you're talking about doing a Western or a horror movie. Um, but I remember, I th Rosemary's Baby has a really creepy one, too. La, and yeah, la, I started thinking la, about la, it. La, yeah, la, it's just... <laughs> it's like all the there's something that you can do drag me to hell is another one oh, where I it just like that one it, it just gets under your skin because there's just that creepy out of tune violin that yes. they always play that sounds like somebody found it in an old house and it just started playing itself and it's just get me out of there good choices i right? like those Riley? well i mean yeah, with these horse this is so hard for me to pick because i feel like they're so well known to me but haven't talked to a lot of people about them. Like everybody always says Halloween and Exorcist. Mm -hmm. I feel like those are always the two that everybody brings up. Like I think of Jerry Goldsmith Poltergeist Ooh. because he did some really great scores, but then when you look at Poltergeist, oh my God, there's like the kids that are singing in the back, you're like, uh-uh. The fact that he could do that and then Rudy. Exactly, right? And, yeah. and yeah. Uh, the, the Omen. Yeah, right. that's right. right. We started with The Omen. Um, so the, the, then I think of like, I know everybody will agree with me, maybe, I don't know, the Friday the 13th, when that score was brought into the, the actual game, mm. I was like, now we're in. Now we're talking. <laughs> this, is, this brings me back. Um, I wonder what some of the other ones. What I noticed recently, I saw Conjuring, and then we went and saw Conjuring 2 again after the press release. That music is really starting to stick with me. There's a very definite tone to it, a definite theme, and a definite, like, 
I, I don't know, rhythm to it that they're, do, that they're using and James Wan is u- utilizing that I just started to notice that I don't hear a lot of people are talking about. Love it. All good. All right, next up, Danielle Quillen asks, what are some of your favorite movies that center around witches? Mine include Practical Magic and Hocus Pocus. Danielle, you and I should be best friends <laughs> <laughs> and have a slumber party. Can because, I join this club? Yes, Perry. <laughs> you, me, and Perry are going to have a, a witches slumber party. Um, those, are, those are two good ones. Not scary witches necessarily. But do you guys have any witch movies that stand out to you? I'm going to go with uh, The Witches of Eastwick. has a lot of good humor Love in there. Yeah. But if you want humor, the funniest film of all time has a great witch sequence in it, and that would be Monty Python and the Holy, Holy Grail. Grail. A witch! <laughs> He weighs as much as a duck. Okay, uh, Perry? Well, I, I have to steal it and go with Hocus Pocus. Okay. I have watched that more times than I can count. I grew up having the biggest crush on the kid that played Max. He was cute. And Binks, actually. Uh, he was also yep. cute. But um, <laughs> I, I'll also add The Craft. I didn't want to throw it in because we had talked about it last week when we were talking about coming-of-age movies, but I love that one. And The Witch is definitely going to end choice. up in some of my favorite witch movies of all sure. time list. All right, Riley? Oh, yeah. And it, yeah, I was going to say the craft and the I finally got to see the witch like maybe a month ago or something and it's like one it's become one of my favorite horror movies all time it is so scary so and I can't really I mean you said them all hocus pocus <laughs> of course I watched that on Halloween you know my girlfriend's like oh my god it's on we're like yeah we're watching this <laughs> love uh, I it. love that the craft I mean just I grew up with it so it's such a I always think of it and I'm not too I'm the witches of Eastwick I love the the cherries That's uh, such a great movie <laughs> Oof, yeah, um I'll, movie. I'll wave the flag for Lords of Salem mm, I am okay. one of the only and that's okay with me I love <laughs> Lords of Salem I love it it's my favorite Rob Zombie movie I just I love how it makes witches just ugly old hags and it's mean and I just love it and also <laughs> um the witches with Angel- Angelica Houston mm-hmm. based on the Road Doll novel um talk about when mm. you're a kid seeing something and then when you're an adult seeing it again what a twisted weird awesome movie a lot of and good like Jim Henson effects yes, in there too. absolutely yeah. and lots of it's very subversive themes as well like lots of weird stuff going on mm-hmm. so give it a rewatch if you want um okay and finally, Mark, a.k.a. Tattooed Dragon 3, because one and two were taken, I guess, um, <laughs> asked, is there a film that you consider so scary that you still find it difficult to watch today? Ooh, Let's start with you, Mark one. Ellis. Uh, all of them. <laughs> I mean, I just, I will get scared easily. So if I'm not going with the obvious choice that we talked about, The Exorcist, the one, the ones that stand out to me are because I'm on the road a lot and I stay in a lot of hotel rooms by myself, uh, either doing stand-up or getting a haircut, or both. The Strangers is one mm. where you're just kind of all alone by yourself. And so, like, if I'm just, like, in bed, and, like, I was binging on Stranger Things and just, like, it, all the lights are off. And it always takes something. It's like, 45 minutes and you just hear something. And then you just look over and the bathroom door is open. And you're just like, I'm sure something evil is in there. It's going to get me. So, hotel based horror movies I try to stay away from too just for sanity at work so like uh, The Shining obviously don't go to that even like something like 1408 don't go near that so not a big fan of hotel horror movies because I take them too seriously mm-hmm. good choices <laughs> alright Perry actually going off of that one that freaked me out quite a bit when I first saw it was Vacancy because I happened mm-hmm. to have been staying with my grandmother at the time when I was watching it and she put me in a room where uh, there were two doors on either side so you know the knocking part where they're knocking on both oh, sides yeah. and I kept, like all night I'm looking at yeah. the two doors. But the one the one that I actually can't really watch, not necessarily because it's so good scary, but because it was kind of too disturbing for me, was Martyrs. Mm. I have a really big problem with Martyrs. And not ne- I don't think it's a bad movie by any means. I do think it's two different movies mashed into one movie. But there's something about it that left me uneasy in just like a really disturbed sense where I, I was just like, I was kind of sad for a couple days after I watched it. So if that's ever on, I won't, I won't be in that room. Mine is similar to yours. It's the original I spit on your grave. Um, I turned it off. To, and not because, not out of protest, not like, I'm not watching this. Just like, you know what? I think I'm good. 
I don't. I, this because it was that time in the in the seventies, I believe, when it was just things were looked a little too real. Kind of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You're kind of like, yeah, but was this a real thing? Because this looks kind of real. Was this just an accident <laughs> yeah, they kept in there? Exactly. And... They accidentally filmed. So um, I spit on your grave. And actually, and not really horror, but slightly genre, I suppose, is um, Clockwork Orange. Mm -hmm. I I don't enjoy watching Clockwork Orange. It's not mm. fun for me. Uh, for you, Mark. Mark uh, you kind of you said it. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, still gets me. It's like sometimes I feel like I'm actually watching a snuff film. Yeah. It's so raw. It's you know the 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 time it was made in. I mean, it, the the first kill that Leatherface does is like you just kind of walked in and saw it. It's so shocking that it get it gives me the chills just thinking about it. And then I'm surprised. I'm surprised with the one that I'm I'm going to say next because we watched it. Uh, maybe a couple months ago, and I'm surprised at how it landed. The Blair Witch Project mm. still gets me, and I know that people are gonna say, "Ah, oh, that's stupid." There's nothing really scary that happened. Using your imagination with that is worse than the actual what you see because you hear the voices in the woods. They're shaking the tent, and then that last scene still gets me. Yeah. It's still I'm just really uncomfortable. I was noticing it. We were watching it. My girlfriend's like, "You're come on, what? That you're not," and I'm like. It's just uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe it's because of the nostalgia of when I saw it when it came out. It really hit me. I'm gonna give that another watch. It's, Probably freak myself out. But. It's freaky, man. And we were watching it. It was like kind of quiet at night. The lights were out. So it, maybe yeah. it was just one of those nights. And also a witch movie. So there, there you go, go. Witch. witch. I was surprised no one had brought that one up. I, I should have brought that up. Well, that was mine. Go. I put it, it off my list because I thought it was too obvious. There well, you go. <laughs> don't never overestimate us, I've Karen. Learned. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't learned by now. That's it for us today. Uh, don't forget to watch AMC or AMC Movie Talk. Wow, I am a <laughs> the old days. <laughs> that was the good old days. Don't forget to watch Collider Movie Talk tomorrow morning, and then the team is off to San Diego. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, team Perry, where can they find you on the internet? You guys can catch me at P Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram, right here on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday on Best of the Week every Saturday, and in Comic Con. Mark right, Mark Ellis. Too many marks. Yeah. Mark Ellis. Well, you can find me in Mark Riley's office. He's kind <laughs> enough to share it with me. Uh, you can find me most days on Collider. Movie talk on Jedi Council occasionally. And then, of course, Schmoes know you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Get all the latest movie reviews right there. And you can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. If you tweet me at night, I probably will be awake. <laughs> and Mark nice. Riley. Uh, you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. And all weekend, Comic-Con is here. So we'll be tweeting. Follow along with Collider Video because we'll be doing updates all weekend. This is going to be crazy, guys. Fabulous. Ready? <laughs> yes, we're ready. We're ready. And you can find me at Clark Wolf. Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. If you enjoy the show, please give it a thumbs up. Please share it. Please tell your friends. And uh, thanks so much for watching. We will see you next week. And until then, we'll see you in your nightmares. <laughs> Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.